Chapter 2. The Bolshevik Factions in the Revolution of 1917 The momentous revolutionary events of 1917 were not sufficient to make the Bolshevik party forget its internal differences and close its ranks to achieve its revolutionary goals. On the contrary, the challenge of revolution only accentuated the differences between the two currents of thought which had been developing within the Bolshevik movement. The left wing heavily reinforced by the influx of former left Menshevik and independent social democratic leaders during 1917, was distinguished by the firm stand it took for revolutionary internationalism and against any cooperation with the provisional government. In shocking policy, the leftists quickly assumed the maximal revolutionary program, looking toward an early introduction of socialist measures and the goal of anarchistic democracy. The Leninist wing, on the contrary, was unsure of itself. At first, it was not inclined to oppose vigorously either the war or the provisional government. In this respect, it was closer to the non-Bolshevik socialist parties than to the Bolshevik left wing during the year. The year. The Leninists were pulled along after the left, but there were, were cons constant ch signs of reluctance. The right lacked confidence in the revolutionary potential of Russia and of Europe. Lenin shocked the whole party and the Leninist wing in particular by the stand he took in his, quote, April Theses, end quote, demanding inalterable opposition to the war and to the provisional government and calling for preparations for the establishment of a revolutionary regime based on the Soviets. The most enthusiastic support for Lenin's program came from the Bolshevik left in spite of their earlier conflicts with him. Graphically speaking, Lenin had moved from his own, quote, Leninist, end quote, wing to the left, a shift which was underscored by its reversal after the October Revolution. Lenin then came once again into conflict with the left wing of the party, this time over the question of making peace with Germany and reverted to the support of those who had been his closest adherents before 1917. Permanent Revolution The cleavage among the Bolsheviks in 1917 and the disputes which divided the party during and after the October Revolution hinged on a subtle but crucial question of the application of the Marxian doctrine to Russia. This was embodied in the forecast and description of revolutionary ideas in Russia called the, quote, theory of permanent revolution, end quote, a set of ideas which played a role in per of particular importance in the history of the Bolshevik movement. In 1917, it provided the Bolsheviks with the basic doctrinal as inspiration and justification for their drive to seize power. When the party divided after 1923 into contending groups of leaders and opposition, the theory of permanent revolution was central among the issues which divided the factions. Authorship of the theory is rightly attributed to Trotsky, with credit for inspiration and assistance going to the Russian-born German socialist A. L. Helplehand Parvis. The two collaborated in the formulation of the idea when Trotsky was in Germany in 1904, and Trotsky worked the proposition out in full while in prison after his arrest in December 1905 as a leader of the original St. Petersburg Soviet. The theory appeared in print in 1906 as an essay, Results and Prospects, the Driving Forces of the Revolution, in a collection of Trotsky's writing on the Revolution of 1905, Our Revolution. Trotsky propounded his theory in an effort to solve a problem which plagued all Russian Marxists. According to the ordinary Marxian analysis, Russia was not supposed to be economically and politically ripe for a socialist revolution. The country was at a stage of social and economic development where only a, quote, bourgeois, end quote, revolution, such as the West had experienced in earlier centuries, could occur. But to let the matter rest here was to abandon serious thought of the working class coming to power in the near future and to resign oneself to the role of legal opposition until capitalist democracy paved the way for the next revolutionary advance. This conclusion was obviously not attractive to those who were by temperament revolutionaries first and foremost. Most of the Mensheviks, on the one other hand, tended to believe in a long evolution for the same reason that they rejected Lenin's rigorous doctrine of the party. They were liberal, moderate, humane, and not fanatical devotees of revolution as an end in itself.
Lenin was a Marxist because he was a revolutionary. When Marxism led to conclusions of an insufficiently revolutionary nature, Lenin refused to accept them and contrived out of Marxist materials a different justification for his unshakable revolutionary stand. The Russian bourgeoisie, according to Lenin, was both too weak and too reactionary to be relied on. The bourgeois revolution would have to be accomplished by the workers and the party which stood for them. A, quote, democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, end quote, would be set up to administer the affairs of state in the interests of the revolutionary classes until such a time as the country would become ready for the transition to socialism. Lenin would have his revolution, whatever the circumstances, determined leadership and the conquest of political power were the historically decisive factors. In 1905, he wrote, quote, the outcome of the revolution depends on whether the working class will play the role of leader of the people's revolution. First, let ruthless struggle decide the question of choosing the path. The workers are striving to crush the reactionary forces without mercy, end quote. A remark Lenin made in 1917 sums up his political philosophy in one line, quote, The question of, at the root of any revolution is the question of governmental power, end quote. The difficulty of reconciling the Marxian philosophy of history with revolutionary fervor under Russian conditions was clearly manifested in the contrasting doctrinal manipulations of the Mensheviks and Lenin. The one group abandoned the fervor, the other verbal professions to the contrary sacrificed the philosophy of history. There remained, however, a third position of little note when it was originated, but of crucial significance for the Bolshevik movement when it prepared to take power. This was Trotsky's thesis of permanent revolution, which managed to reconcile the Marxian strictures on the conditions for proletarian revolution and the Russian radicals' desire for immediate action. Trotsky's argument began with the observation conceded by the other Marxists that Russia's economic and social development inspired and accelerated by contact with the more advanced West, had proceeded unevenly. The middle class was not the only revolutionary force in Russia. The Russian economy, growing with the help of Western capital and technology, acquired amidst its prevalent peasant backwardness the most modern forms of large-scale industry. In consequence, the working class grew quickly, both in numbers and in revolutionary sentiment. A compound social struggle had begun to emerge, the government and part of the landlords versus almost everyone else on the one hand, and the industrialists versus the workers on the other. This situation led both Lenin and Trotsky to conclude in 1905 that the middle class was likely to desert the revolution in order to protect its property interests, and that the, quote, bourgeois, end quote, revolution, meaning, meaning the attainment of democracy and civil liberties, and the expropriation of the landlords, would have to be carried through by the proletariat to reconcile this necessity with the prognosis of extended capitalist development for Russia, Lenin advanced the formula of the, quote, democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry, end quote. Trotsky found a different solution of the problem by viewing the Russian proletariat in the context of an international revolutionary movement. He theorized that after the Russian proletariat was called upon to make, take the lead in the bourgeois revolution, it would install a socialist regime in power. Here is the first sense of the, quote, permanency, end quote, of the revolution. The revolution is permanent or continuous over the period when the bourgeois revolution is completed and socialist revolution begun. Such a socialist regime would, could not endure in Russia alone because of the social and economic backwardness of the country, but help from abroad would be automatic. The revolution in Russia would be the signal for a general socialist revolution in Europe. This is the second sense of the, quote, permanency, end quote, of the revolution. A permanently revolutionary situation as the revolution spreads from Russia to the advanced countries. Industrial Russia would become an integral part of socialist Europe. Towards Russia, excuse me, backward Russia would become a common problem for all of Europe and thus would be reduced to relatively manageable proportions. Between 1905 and 1917, the theory of permanent revolution or kindred ideas became increasingly popular in leftist circles within the Russian Marxist movement. One of the most vigorous exponents was Rosa Luxemburg. Pakrovsky, 
the periodist and Bolshevik historian, though later an arch critic of Trotsky, evidenced sympathy for the concept. Bukharin and Radek, among others, expressed their adherence to the theory during the war. Quote, permanent revolution, end quote was the only satisfactory intellectual solution for those Russian Marxists who tried to retain the spirit of Western Marxism while remaining vigorously revolutionary. As anti-Trotsky polemics later stressed, Lenin did, at first, take sharp exception to Trotsky's view. During the war years, however, Lenin's intense anti-war internationalism brought him to a position that was, for all practical purposes, close to Trotsky's. Quote, the task of the proletariat of Russia, end quote, Lenin wrote in 1915, quote, is to complete the bourgeois democratic revolution in Russia in order to kindle the socialist revolution in Europe, end quote. The outbreak of revolution and the fall of the Tsar in February 1917 prompted Lenin to proclaim, quote, only a special coincidence of historical conditions has made the proletariat of Russia, for a certain, perhaps very short time, the advanced skirmisher of the revolutionary proletariat of the whole world, end quote. Lenin had now fully embraced permanent revolution in its international sense. The February Revolution caught the Bolsheviks completely off guard. The assumption of power by a conservative middle-class regime, supposedly impossible, made Lenin's doctrine of the democratic dictatorship meaningless. Events were proceeding more nearly according to the Menshevik expectation. The Mensheviks, together with most of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, reacted as they had planned by becoming a loyal opposition. The Soviets, which these parties initially dominated, were guided in this direction. In their responses to the establishment of the provisional government, the Bolsheviks, decide, excuse me, the Bolsheviks divided and the basic cleavage between the cautious and the bold was dramatically revealed. Most of the old line Leninist leadership in Russia tacitly admitted that the Menshevik analysis had been borne out. They accepted the, quote, bourgeois, end quote, provisional government as the most advanced possible and took on for themselves the role of watchdog and occasional prod in the interest of the democratic revolution. However, Lenin and the left-wingers, both Bolshevik and Menshevik, refused to let the revolution coast along in this manner. Openly or implicitly, they embraced Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution with all the ultra-revolutionary hopes for Russia which this idea implied. In his April theses, Lenin announced the program which he had worked out for Russia on the basis of his dream of international revolution, quote, all power to the Soviets, end quote, and the overthrow of the provisional government, which was to Lenin an integral part of international imperialism. The immediate test issue was the prosecution of the war. Peace was a widespread demand among the Russian populace, but to achieve it, Lenin maintained, quote, we need a workers' government, allied in the first place with the mass of the poorest village population, and secondly with the revolutionary workers of all the warring countries, end quote. At the same time, Trotsky in New York was independently expressing himself in the same fashion, quote, at the head of the popular masses, the Russian revolutionary proletariat will fulfill its historic task. It is necessary to liquidate not only czarism, but also the war. It is the duty of the revolutionary proletariat of Russia to show that behind the evil imperialist will of the liberal bourgeoisie, there is no strength, for it has no support in the worker masses." End quote. The theory of permanent revolution had a dual significance for the year of revolution. As the guide for Bolshevik strategy, It encouraged the seizure of power and gave doctrinal sanction to this, quote, workers, end quote, revolution. This, worker, this, quote, workers, end quote, revolution. In a country professedly unripe for socialism. At the same time, it constituted a remarkably accurate forecast and description of the course of revolutionary events, internally, that is. To this extent, it was no doubt unique as an example of the pragmatic testing of a social theory. Certain actions were called for which, by their success, upheld the theory. The Bolsheviks were carried into power on the wave of mass dissatisfaction with the provisional government, and then, after completing the, quote, bourgeois, end quote, reforms, such as land distribution and church disestablishment, they proceeded to such socialistic measures as nationalization of the banks and workers' control of industry. In October 1917, it was firmly believed, particularly the left wing of the Bolshevik party, that the international extension of the revolution was certain to follow. 
Bukharin's fancies of 1918 exemplified the party's endorsement of Trotsky's theory. Quote, the permanent revolution in Russia is passing into the European proletarian revolution, end quote. This was a necessity, according to the theory, if the socialist regime in Russia were to survive, but in this vital respect, events failed to conform to the theory. The spark did not set off the conflagration. The eagerly anticipated revolution in the West never materialized. In, in default of the success of international socialism, the Marxian premises of the theory left Russia no hope. The industrial prerequisites for socialism were lacking in sufficient quantity, and an isolated effort to establish socialism in Russia was bound to fail. Such conclusions were arrived at before long by various Bolshevik groups, even before the October uprising, when the cautious wing of the party under Zinoviev and Kamenev opposed the venture. They argued that the revolution in Europe was not likely, and that the Bolshevik party was consequently bound to fail if it tried to rule. After the coup, it was the turn of the left wing of the party to invoke the internationalist premise. The left communists took their stand against peace with Germany on the grounds that revolutionary war was called for to precipitate the European Socialist Revolution, and that a Russian regime which preserved itself by avoiding such action would, by its isolation, be compelled to assume a non-socialist form. Lenin's decisions to make peace prevailed, through the, though the entire party still looked forward eagerly to the day when the proletarians of Europe would come to the aid of the Russian comrades. That day never came. That the socialist regime should have survived in Russia under these circumstances was, according to the theory, impossible. That it did, that it did was to be variously explained. Did the persistence of the regime imply that it had conformed to circumstantial limitations and ceased to be socialist? The left opposition argued in this vein after 1923 and more and more insist, with more and more insistence until they were silenced in 1927. Or could the survival of the Soviet regime be taken as evidence that the material conditions of Russian life were no serious bar, given the will and the effort to the construction of a socialist society in the Soviet Union independently of events abroad? Such was the theoretical solution which Stalin advanced. It had its appeal, and but it could not in any atmosphere of free discussion be defended as orthodox Marxism. Quote, rearming the party, end quote. The fall of Nicholas II released the Russian nation into the dazzling, unfamiliar light of political freedom. The police were gone, and the underground groups became legal. Surprised but excited, political exiles of all hues flocked to the capital from, Siberia deten from Siberian detention or refuge refuges abroad. The atmosphere was one of tumultuous hope and incipient chaos. Doctrines were thrown askew. A few political figures had clear notions of where they were headed. During the interval, during the interval between the February Revolution and Lenin's return, no group was more confused and disorganized than the Bolsheviks in Russia. With its leading lights still abroad, the group had no one other, no one who could supply authoritative leadership. On the pressing question of the proper attitude toward the new provisional government and the war, the party soon found itself divided into three distinct factions, left, right, and center. The left-wing Bolsheviks, numerically weak but influential in Petrograd, assumed an anti-government and anti-war stand that chanced to be very close to that of Lenin and the left-wing emigres. Most of the better-known Bolsheviks in Russia, and especially the Siberian exiles, took a much less uncompromising position. Still, another group decided that it that with the advent of the Republic, defensism had finally become justified. Such were the ultra-right Bolsheviks led by N.P. Avilov, V.S. Voitinsky, and V. Bazarov. With the exception of Avilov, they soon left the ranks of the Bolshevik party altogether. For a short time after the Re February Revolution, the left-wing Bolsheviks, led by the previously underground bureau of the Central Committee, consisting of Molotov, A.G. Shlyepnikov, and P.A. Zalutsky were in the ascendancy in the Petrograd organization of the party. They took it upon themselves to denounce the provisional government and urged the Soviets to take power into their hands. Quote, the fundamental task of the revolutionary social democracy is, as before, the struggle for the transformation of the present anti-popular imperialist war into a civil war of the peoples against their oppressors, the ruling classes. End quote. The Mezraansi, the quote, interdistrict, end quote, Menshevik group, 
supported this left-wing Bolshevik position and proclaimed to the soldiers, quote, take power into your own hands, end quote. Such fervor, however, was offset by unsureness, and the Bolshevik leaders failed to take the most extreme stand in the form of the Soviet. Excuse me, in the form of the Soviet. Negotiations for left-wing unity were in progress with the Mez Mezrayansi, and according to Shlyapnikov, a complete merger with that group had almost been reached. Quote, in the middle of March, this question was settled decisive, excuse me, settled positively, and only the appearance within our party of differences with the comrades returning from Siberia and the jump to the side of defensism of our Pravda prevented a merger then. End quote. Shlyapnikov. The return of the, quote, comrades from Siberia, end quote, was the occasion for a virtual of a virtual coup d'etat within the Bolshevik organization. Among the new arrivals were Bolshevik dignitaries who far outranked the party workers previously in charge of the Petrograd organization. M. K. Muranov had been a Duma deputy. Stalin was a member of the Central Committee. Prior to his arrest in 1914, Kamenev had been one of Lenin's principal lieutenants. The first act of the new group as they assumed the reins of leadership was to reverse the editorial policy of Pravda. They adopted the Menshevik and Socialist Revolutionary formula of supporting the provisional government, quote, insofar as, end quote, it did not directly violate the interests of the masses and they abandoned unqualified opposition to the war. Quote, the solution, end quote, wrote Stalin, quote, is the course of pressure on the provisional government with the demand for it to declare its agreement to open peace negotiations immediately, end quote. The factional differences among the Bolsheviks appeared even more clearly at the Conference of, conference of Bolshevik Delegates who had come to the capital for the first all-Russian conference of Soviets held at the end of March. The center leadership of, the, of Kamenev and Stalin drew the backing of the Moscow City Bolshevik organization and much of the Petrograd membership and was supported by two former conciliators, Rykov and Nogin, who were to become leading figures in the Bolshevik right during 1917. On the left with the Petrograd Bureau stood the Moscow Regional Bureau, representing the party organization throughout the central part of European Russia, and later was the primary left-wing stronghold during the ensuing year. <laughs> Alexandra Kolontai, who had been in close touch with Lenin before her return in, to Russia, arrived in time to join the critics on the left. The left-wingers at the conference boldly proclaimed the internationalist premises of permanent revolution. Quote, the Russian Revolution can secure for the people of Russia maximum democratic liberties and witness reform... Excuse me, I don't know why I said that. Quote, the Russian Revolution can secure for the people of Russia a maximum of democratic liberty and social reforms only if it becomes the point of departure for the revolutionary movement of the West European par proletariat, proletariat against their bourgeois governments, end quote. The provisional government, as far as the leftists were concerned, was nothing but a nest of counter-revolutionary treachery. Quote, there is a conspiracy of the provisional government against the people and the revolution, and it is necessary to prepare for a struggle against it, end quote. A, quote, workers' red guard, end quote, was the means that they urged to this end, and they hailed the Soviets as the, quote, embryo of revolutionary power, end quote. The Kamenev Stalin center group equivocated, it put through a resolution calling for all peoples to revolt against their warring governments and for, quote, the real transfer of power into the hands of the proletariat and the revolutionary democracy, end quote. At the same time, the resolution stated that only the eventuality of the enemy government's refusal to make peace would, quote, compel the people who have risen up to take the war into their own hands as a war for the liberty of the peoples in alliance with the proletariat of Western Europe up to that moment, rejecting the disorganization of the army and considering the preservation of its strength to be essential as a bulwark against counter-revolution, we call on all soldiers and workers to remain at their posts and to maintain firm organization." End quote. Stalin expressed the same ambivalence in speaking of the provisional government as, quote, the fortifier of the conquests of the revolutionary people, end quote. 
Under proper control by the Soviets, Stalin maintained the provisional government could prove to be of considerable, though temporary, usefulness. Once the government had, quote, exhausted, end quote, itself, the time would be ripe for the Soviets to take power. But the idea of, quote, support, end quote, for the provisional government proved to be too much for the conference, and Stalin's draft resolution was amended to delete such a reference. It is clear that a majority of the Bolsheviks in Russia at the time of the February Revolution were at a loss when it came to evaluating the new regime. Differing basically with Lenin, the Bolshevik moderates hesitated to take a radical stand on the provisional government or the war lest, much a, lest such a course of action disrupt the democratic revolution. Wrote the Menshevik observer Sukhanov, quote, I had no doubt that Kamenev was trying to follow a line of genuine struggle for peace in the concrete circumstances of the moment. All the actions of the then leader of the Bolshevik party had just this kind of, quote, possibilist, end quote, sometimes too moderate character, end quote. Lenin reached Petrograd via Finland on the 3rd of April, 1917, after his celebrated, quote, sealed car trip, and his, quote, sealed car, end quote, trip across Germany. The effect on the Bolsheviks was volcanic. The party was shaken to its foundations as Lenin imposed his relentless will to refashion it into an instrument of successful revolution. On, the, on that day, the course of history was laid out for decades to come. Received by his Bolshevik associates and other leaders of the Soviet in a festive mood, Lenin shocked them with his fanatical attitude. His first move was to denounce, excuse me, was to pounce on Kamenev. Quote, what is this that's being written in Pravda? We saw several numbers and really swore at you, end quote. Disdaining the greetings of the moderate leaders of the Soviet, Lenin turned to the crowds, quote, I am happy to greet in your persons the victorious Russian Revolution. The piratical imperialist war is the beginning of civil war throughout Europe. The Russian Revolution accomplished by you has prepared the way and, an, and opened a new epoch. Long live the worldwide socialist revolution, end quote. That night, the following day, Lenin proclaimed to the astonishment of the Bolshevik leaders assembled to hear him his will to take power. This was the essence of his memorable April Theses. Quote, I shall never forget that thunder-like speech, end quote, wrote Sukhanov, quote, which startled and amazed not only me, a heretic, who had accidentally dropped in, but all the true believers. I am certain that no one expected anything of the sort, end quote. Tacitly accepting the theory of permanent revolution, Lenin declared, quote, The peculiarity of the present situation in Russia lies in the transition from the first stage of the revolution to its second stage, which is to place power in the hands of the proletariat and the poorest strata of the peasantry, end quote. Mercilessly, he tore into the current Bolshevik leadership, quote, Pravda demands that the government announce annexation, excuse me, renounce annexations. To demand that a government of capitalists renounce annexations is nonsense, a crying mockery. Even our own Bolsheviks show confidence in the government. It is the death of socialism. In that case, our ways must part. The majority of the social democrats have betrayed socialism, have the will to build a new party. End quote. A Bolshevik witness has described the consternation occasioned by Lenin's reversal of the party line. Quote, his speech produced on everyone a stupefying impression. No one expected this. On the contrary, they expected Vladimir Ilyich to arrive and call to order the Russian Bureau of the Central Committee and especially Comrade Molotov, who occupied a particularly irreconcilable position with respect to the provisional government. It appeared, however, that Molotov himself was closest of all to Ilyich, end quote. For a time, Lenin met with very little response from his own party except for the small Molotov Shlyapnikov left wing from the underground and a few returned emigres such as Kolontai. On the 8th of April, the day after Lenin's April Theses appeared in Pravda, Kamenev published a statement explaining that Lenin did not speak for the party and that the proposition of a quick transition from the democratic to the socialist revolution was untenable. Quote, we hope to defend our point of view, end quote. Kamenev asserted confidently, quote, 
as the only possible one for revolutionary social democrats as long as they want dot 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 to remain a party of the revolutionary masses of the proletariat and not be transformed into a group of communist propagandists end quote propagandists end quote the same day the petrograd city committee of the party considered lenin's theses and voted its disapproval 13 to 2. To one party member, Lenin's policy was, quote, utopian, explained by his prolonged lack of contact with Russian life, end quote. Lucarn later recalled this at a time, excuse me, recalled this as a, as a time, quote, when part of our own party looked upon, bracket, the April Theses, end bracket, as a virtual betrayal of accepted Marxist ideology, end quote. Lenin, Undaunted by the initial rebuff, stood adamantly against the provisional government, which he employed, excuse me, while he employed the magnetic, almost hypnotic power of his personal leadership to win the party over to his radical line. Within two weeks, he had scored a substantial success at a conference of the Petrograd City Organization of the Bolsheviks attended by all the national leaders of the party. A hardcore resistance to Lenin nevertheless stood firm. Kamenev flatly opposed Lenin's program of power to the Soviets and proposed instead, quote, the most watchful control, end quote, by the Soviets over the provisional government. The conference killed this formula by a vote of 20 to 6 with nine abstentions. In the meantime, the provisional government, not yet two months old, was splitting apart at the seams. Mass demonstrations against the government's foreign policy, the so-called April Days, precipitated the first cabinet crisis and paved the way for a coalition of Duma and Soviet leaders. While the Bolshevik Central Committee rejected a, quote, down with the provisional government, end quote, slogan as adventurous, the Moscow organization of the party issued a blazing manifesto for revolutionary demonstrations, workers' guards, and assumption of power by the Soviets. As the political atmosphere became more radical, the Bolshevik opposition to Lenin gave way. This was the mood on April 24th. Excuse me, this was the mood when, on April 24th, Bolshevik leaders from all over the country met formally for the 7th All-Russian Party Conference. Neither Kamenev nor Stalin, the March leaders, was elected to the Presidium of Five. Lenin reiterated his stand against the provisional government and the war. Kamenev persisted in his opposition, delivered a minority report, quote, It is too early to say that bourgeois democracy has exhausted all of its possibilities, end quote. Kamenev affirmed again the desirability of cooperation with the, quote, petty bourgeois, end quote, groups, and urged, quote, control, end quote, by the revolutionaries over the actions of a necessarily bourgeois government. Lenin was supported against Kamenev's criticism by Zinoviev, who had returned from Switzerland with him, and by Stalin. Stalin was quick to trim his sails to the new wind. Almost alone of the prominent Bolshevik leaders, he never ventured to oppose the clearly expressed will of Lenin. On matters of practical import, Lenin carried all before him at the April conference. In condemning continuation of the war, the assemblage was unanimous, with the exception of seven die-hard right-wingers who had abstained. When the conference endorsed, quote, prolonged work, end quote, to, quote, guarantee the successful transfer of all state power into the hands of the Soviets, end quote, only three of the 133 voting delegates voted no, with eight abstaining. For the ultra-right Bolsheviks, the April conference marked the parting of the ways. Most of them soon went over to the Mensheviks. The theoretical implications of permanent revolution embodied in a proposed resolution brought forth the most concerted opposition which Lenin met at the conference. <laughs> Rykov tried to urge caution, quote, Whence will arise the son of the socialist overturn? I think that under present conditions, with our standard of living, the initiation of the socialist overturn does not belong to us. We have not the strength, the objective conditions for this, end quote. Quote, before us stand gigantic revolutionary tasks, end quote, Rykov admitted. Quote, 
But the execution of these tasks does not lead us out of the framework of the bourgeois system, end quote. The, re the resolution did concede that, quote, the proletariat of Russia, acting in one of the most backward countries of Europe, among the small peasant masses of the population, cannot pose for itself the goal of rapid realization of socialist reform, end quote. Socialists would indeed come to power, they hoped, and begin measures of control and anti-bureaucratic reform, pointing toward large proportion of the conference failed to be convinced. Where am I? The resolution... So there's some kind of typo here. I'm looking at it and trying to see how I can... All right, I'm just going to read what it says, and then people can, other people can try to get something out of it. Socialists would indeed come to power, they hoped, and begin measures of control and anti-bureaucratic reform, pointing toward large proportion of the conference, failed to con be convinced. The resolution... It's like the... <laughs> All right, I think there's like a, okay, the lines are mixed up. Like the, the lines somehow got switched, so I'm going to see if I can get it. Socialists would indeed come to power, they hoped, and begin measures of control and anti-bureaucratic reform pointing towards socialism, though such success depended on an early international revolution. A large proportion of the conference failed to be convinced. The resolution carried by a majority of only 24 against the total of no's and abstentions in a total vote of 118. In view of this persisting timidity, Lenin did not press his plans immediately. Further splitting was avoided, but the price Lenin paid was almost equal representation for the right-wing faction in the party leadership. The new Central Committee elected at the close of the April conference included four rightists, Kamenev, Nagin, VP, VP Milyutin, and G.F. Fedorov, together with Lenin and his supporters Zinoviev, Stalin, Sverdol, Sverdlov, and I.T. Smilga. Throughout the rest of 1917, the undercurrent of caution was felt in the Bolshevik party on one critical occasion after another. The party had yielded to Lenin's leadership, but only with great reluctance was the right dragged to the point of taking power. Lenin turned to seek more allies, and his quest was well rewarded. Between May and July, the Bolshevik party drew into its ranks a swarm of illustrious left-wing Mensheviks, with Trotsky at their head. The new recruits, far more resolute than of Lenin's old henchmen, figured among the key leaders in the seizure of power. In July, the Bolsheviks experienced a serious setback. In the course of the, quote, July days, end quote, popular revolutionary demonstrations got out of hand and became riots. The Bolsheviks were blamed for an attempt to seize power, though actually they had rejected the idea as unseasonable. Conveniently, documents came to light on the basis of which the provisional government, now ha headed by Alexander Kerensky, denounced the Bolshevik leaders as German agents. In this famous forgery, the ex-Bolshevik Aleksinsky had a hand. The Bolshevik party was prescribed and its leaders threatened with arrest. Lenin and Zinoviev went into hiding, where they remained until the eve of the October Revolution. Kamenev was arrested and for a time jailed, as were Trotsky and Lunacharsky, when they quixotically demanded treatment equal to that accorded the Bolsheviks with whom they sympathized.
the effort by the provisional government to suppress the Bolsheviks was so was far from enough. Excuse me, what am I saying? The effort by the provisional government to suppress the Bolsheviks was far from thorough, and they were able to proceed with their Sixth Party Congress, which met from July 26th to August 3rd. This is the first conclave claiming such a status since 1907. With most of the top-ranking leaders absent, however, the Congress was reduced to largely inconclusive wrangling about revolutionary strategy and tactics. Its most notable achievement was to formalize was to formalize the unification of the Bolsheviks and the revolutionary Mensheviks, and thus establish the party on lines which were to hold for the next ten years. The Absorption of the Menshevik Left during the honeymoon days after the overthrow of Nicholas II, the idea of reunification was on the tip of every social democratic tongue. In some local organizations, the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks immediately combined. Some Mensheviks proposed that the factions merge fully. The ultra-right Bolsheviks, who, were found, who found themselves in full agreement with the Mensheviks on most issues, were wholeheartedly in favor of the proposed merger said Stalin, expressing the, quote, center, end quote, viewpoint of the Bolshevik leadership at the March conference, quote, we ought to do it. Unification is possible along the line of Zimmerwald Kintal, end quote, Stalin. Only the Bolshevik left wing opposed unity with the Mensheviks. Complained Zalutsky, who had just been displaced from his short-lived prominence with the Petrograd Party Bureau, quote, only a petty bourgeois and not a social democrat can proceed from a mere desire for unification. It is impossible to unite on the basis of superficial adherence to Zimmerwald Kienthal. I guess it's Zimmerwald Kienthal. End quote. Stalin dismissed this objection, quote, There is no use running ahead and anticipating disagreements. There is no party life without disagreements, end quote. The Bolsheviks' March conference had approved consultations with the Mensheviks on the subject of unification. The more concrete proposal for ties with the internationalist wing of the Mensheviks passed by only one vote. This seems to have met with disfavor, not only among the Bolshevik left, but also among the ultra-right Bolsheviks, who apparently feared that it would encourage a split among the Mensheviks and endanger the prospects for uni reunification of the whole Social Democratic Party. One Menshevik, speaking before a joint meeting of the factions, actually proposed an, an open realignment on the basis of the defensist internationalist cleavage among both the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks. As it turned out, this was almost precisely what happened. The idea of unification was abruptly set back with Lenin's return to Russia. At the conclusion of his April theses, Lenin bluntly exclaimed, quote, Unity with the defensis is treason to socialism, end quote. Most of the Bolsheviks were unwilling to accept Lenin's intransigence and voted with their Menshevik associates to set up a joint organization bureau to prepare a unification congress. Then, vacillating, the Bolshevik leaders declined to participate in this bureau except for the right-wingers Wojtynski and Goldenberg, who were already on their way toward an open shift to the Menshevik side. Nothing further came of the plan of overall Bolshevik-Menshevik unity, but it left the Bolsheviks and the anti-war left wing of the Mensheviks ready to come to terms. The Bolshevik April Conference resolved that, quote, "...reproachment and unification with groups and currents which in fact stand on the ground of internationalism is indispensable, on the basis of a break with the policy of petty bourgeois treason to socialism." End quote. This kept the unification movement alive, but reduced substantially to what it had been in 1915 and 1916, in a question of the absorption of the anti-war socialist into the Bolshevik ranks. Here again, the organizational issue proved to be a disruptive factor. The Mezrayansi 
Mensheviks, who are almost Bolsheviks, had been discussing unity with the Bolsheviks ever since the February Re Revolution. The idea of absorbing the Mezhrai Ansi required immediate practical import, excuse me, acquired immediate practical import for Lenin when, on May 4th, Trotsky returned to Russia and assumed a position of leadership in that group. For both parties, the advantages of coalescence were obvious. Trotsky and his associates among the Mezhrai lacked a broad following and could make themselves effective only in Lenin's mass organization, but they would bring to the Bolsheviks valuable talent as agitators and a great deal of revolutionary prestige. Moreover, Lenin had not disposed of the cautious right wing in his own party. Union with the Menshevik left would, and did, provide strategic reinforcement for the revolutionary position within the ranks of the Bolsheviks. On May 10th, the Bolsheviks and Mezhrayansi meant met to discuss unification. Trotsky indicated that he had abandoned the hope of bringing all the Russian Social Democrats under one roof and accepted the Bolshevik condition of unity among the anti-war groups alone. Appearing to let bygones be bygones, Lenin gave the Mezhrayansi an unconditional invitation to join the Bolshevik party, and he promised Trotsky and his associates leading positions in the party organization and on the editorial board of Pravda. There were, however, objections on both sides. The Bolshevik leadership turned down Lenin's first proposal that Trotsky be made an editor of Pravda. Trotsky, while observing with satisfaction that the Bolsheviks had, quote, de-Bolshevized, end quote, themselves, balked at the party label, quote, I cannot call myself a Bolshevik. Old factional labels are undesirable, end quote. Lenin reportedly thought Trotsky's pride was to blame for this. Certain tactical considerations, as well as the old, reor the old organizational discords, contributed to the delay of the merger. Both Lenin and Mezhrayansi hoped that if they proceeded slowly, all the internationalist Mensheviks, particularly Martov and his following, could be brought into the Bolshevik camp. Lunacharsky, who inclined to the Bolshevik right after he entered the party with the Mezhrayansi, wanted Martov to join the Bolsheviks in order to become the head of a right wing with decisive influence. These hopes did not materialize. Martov, though he had no substantial programmatic differences with the Bolsheviks, steadfastly refused to be associated with their tactical and organizational habits. It was not until after the July days, when Lenin was hiding in Finland and Trotsky was in jail, that the Sixth Party Congress formed a formally accepted the Mezhrayansi into the Bolshevik ranks. Some of the Bolsheviks were still disgruntled by the move. No doubt Trotsky's dazzling personality and outstanding reputation soured the more pedestrian figures who had been helping Lenin run the Bolshevik party. The origin of the long and bitter hostility between Trotsky and Zinoviev is without doubt to be found in the natural resentment felt by Zinoviev, Lenin's closest collaborator since 1909, it being overshadowed by the illustrious newcomer. Possibly Zinoviev's chagrin over this situation influenced his shift to the right wing of the party and his opposition to the insurrection, though his often mentioned cowardice may well have been a factor too. Opposition to the merger, even after it was consummated at the Sixth Congress, was also prompted by lingering uneasiness about, quote, petty bourgeois, end quote, groups who were not fully committed to the Bolsheviks' principles of organization. On August 4th, when the new Central Committee, without Lenin's presence, was reorganized, the party newspaper, a renewed proposal to make Trotsky one of the editors, was voted down 11 to 10. Not until September, when Trotsky had been released from jail and was becoming the dominant figure in the Petrograd Soviet, did the Central Committee reverse itself and accept him as an editor along with Kamenev, Stalin, and Sokolnikov. Sokolnikov. The composition of the new Central Committee, which was elected at the Sixth Congress, reflected the heterogeneous character of the new Bolshevik leadership, which together with the simultaneous influx of new rank-and-file members gave the party a complexion substantially different from that of its underground days. Eight members of the Central Committee elected in April kept their positions Lenin, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Stalin, Zverdlov, Nagin, Milutin, and Smilga. Fedorov alone was dropped. 
while one of the candidate members, Bubnov, was promoted to full status. These had all been firm followers of Lenin before 1917, if exception is made for lapses during the boycottist enthusiasm of 1906 and 1907. But the rightist tendency among this group of old leaders was pronounced in March and April of 1917. Kamenev, Stalin, Miliutin, and Nagin were prominent in advancing the early line of caution. While Stalin shifted to follow Lenin, Zinoviev gravitated toward the right. Lenin's leadership depended on new officer material. Twelve members of the new Central Committee were entirely fresh. For three, Y. A. Berzin, F. A. Artem Sergeyev, and S. G. Shaman, Shamian, there is no evidence that they were anything but loyal followers of Lenin. The same applies to the former Duma deputy, Muranov. Unless his espousal of the moderate position in March 1917 had more than episodic significance. On the other hand, Rykov, leader of the Bolshevik conciliators before the war, had stood with the right wing consistently. Sokolnikov, Sokolnikov was the former conciliator who had gone over to the Trotsky, Martov, Nasha, Slovo group during the war. Bukharin and Dzerzhinsky, Dzerzhinsky, represented those Bolsheviks who had criticized Lenin from the left in 1915 and 1916. The future Trotskyist party secretary, Nikolai Nikolaevich Krestinsky, was a Bolshevik associate of the left Menshevik paper, Novoya Zhin's New Life, which Gorky now edited. Three new members of the Central Committee had never been Bolsheviks before the war. Kolontai, who had come over from the Mensheviks in 1915 and was the first to endorse Lenin's April Theses, and two, Mezrayantsi, Uritsky, and, most importantly of all, Trotsky. The new party leadership was anything but a collection of disciplined yes-men. With the round of, rounding out of the Bolshevik party and its leadership that was accomplished in the summer of 1917, the personal basis was laid for the factional controversies that broke out after the revolution. The group of former deviationists from Lenin rallied to inspire the party onward to revolution was the embodiment of left-wing idealism and political philosophy and the primary source of the series of left opposition movements that rent the party between 1918 and 1927. At a glance, the pre-revolutionary political careers of some of the later left opposition leaders shows their strong reservations about Lenin. Trotsky, as his enemies never tired of pointing out, was a Menshevik or a non-factional independent until he joined the Bolshevik party with the Mezrayansi in July 1917. Trotsky's close supporters, Rakovsky and Yoff, had been old associates of his and di also did not become Bolsheviks until 1917. Kolontai, one of the principal leaders of the workers' opposition in 1920 to 1921, was a Menshevik until 1915. Larin, a vocal critic of the party leadership from 1921 to 23, joined the Bolsheviks at a Menshevik as a ben Menshevik internationalist in 1917. Antonov Ovsayenko, a supporter of Trotsky in 1923 had been a Menshevik and a member of the Nasha Slovo group. Radek, subsequently an active common term leader, had participated in the Polish and German Social Democratic parties as an extreme internationalist and adhered to, and adhered to the left Bolshevik question, position during the war. Bukharin, a left winger up to 1921 and subsequently the leader of the right opposition against Stalin, had not been a left Bolshevik during the war, but previously had, by his own admission, quote, a certain heretical partiality to imperial criticism, end quote. Just a side note, um, uh, I guess I should, I should just say this about the entire book, but especially in the period of, you know, uh, post-Civil War uh, Bolshevik politics, that, uh, who's the fuck's guy? There's this guy, Alexei Gusev. Um, I don't know if you've, anyone's watched uh, Gusev. I don't know if anybody's watched it, but there's a video on the Haymarket website about some documents that were recently uncovered that were found in like an old prison 
uh, that contained important uh, documents from imprisoned left oppositionists. Anyway, but uh, during that interview, one of the guys, main people who's speaking, uh, Alexei Gusev, who wrote, who had an entry in the book edited by uh, Simon Pirani and Wendy Goldman and uh, other people uh, about Soviet labor history, uh, he said that you know we should put the uh, we should put every large parts of the categories that are used to discuss this period of history in quotation marks, and that includes the quote uh, right opposition and like quote left. Um, they should be kind of put in brackets because they're uh, uh, their names are not strictly. Uh, those uh, appellations are not strictly neutral uh, in terms of how they were applied at the time and how they're applied now. Um, anyway, sorry about that. Piatikov, another wartime left Bolshevik, later one of Trotsky's principal supporters, began his political career as an anarchist and became a Bolshevik only around 1910. V.V. Osinski, one of the leaders of the Democratic Centralist Opposition Group from 1919 to 1923 has been an Ots, a, an Ots Ovist. Vladimir Smirnov, another leading Democratic Centralist, had been an associate of Bukharin and Osinsky at Moscow University. This suggestion of a close relationship between deviation from Lenin's line before the revolution and opposition activity afterwards is strengthened by certain statistical conclusions which arise from considerations of the records of other Bolshevik leaders. The connections between earlier deviation and later opposition and between both of these and life as an emigre in Western Europe are also clear. Of 35 left oppositionists, 16, 46% had records of pre-revolutionary deviation. Of 34 non-oppositionists, only 8, 24% had been deviators. The distinction becomes much sharper if the factors of intellectual background and life in the emigration are taken into account. One, 31 intellectual emigres, 23, 74%, excuse me, of 31 intellectual emigres, 23%, excuse me, 23, 74% were deviators. None of the non-deviators became a left oppositionist. Those who did, did become left oppositionists had all been deviators. On the other hand, only two of 30 non-intellectual undergrounders had records of deviation, and both became oppositionists. Twelve of the non-deviators, however, became left oppositionists. The fact that the intellectual undergrounders, like the non-intellectuals, did not often acquire records of deviation leading to the conclusion that life in the emigration was the main stimulus to pre-revolutionary deviation. Life in the underground, on the contrary, tended to suppress deviation or conceal the record of it. This is undoubtedly why many undergrounders with no record of deviation became left op op oppositionists, while non-deviating emigres did not. If a man in the emigration had any affinity with the non-Leninist current of Bolshevism, this inclination would have been manifested clearly in the course of the many controversies which took place. This analysis lends only the slightest support to the frequently expressed idea that the opposition leaders were more intellectual and the non-oppositionists more proletarian. Of the 38 oppositionists, 22 58% were intellectuals. Of 48 non-oppositionists, non 25, 52% were intellectuals. After 1921, however, the opposition support was definitely concentrated in intellectual circles. It is clear that the left opposition after the revolution was part of a current of political thought that had constantly been opposed to the strict followers of Lenin since pre-revolutionary days. This fact lends some credence, credence to the allegation made by the Stalinists during their struggle with the opposition in the 20s that their adversaries were not genuine Bolsheviks at all, but essentially Menshevik in outlook.
By this time, the charge of Menshevism was almost tantamount to that of treason, and the oppositionists felt themselves obliged to refute accusations as best they could. As a result, they went to far toward complete endorsement of the Leninist organizational system, which had only helped strengthen Stalin the more. And the ideological confusion stirred up in the course of the controversy obscured the nature of the left opposition movement as a whole. In the middle of 1917, however, Bolshevik thinking was not centered on organizational hardness, which both originally and later distinguished the movement. With the general social democratic realignment, with the entry of new leaders and spokesmen into the Bolshevik party, and with Lenin's own reorientation, the Bolsheviks came to be distinguished primarily by their revolutionary fervor and by their utopian hopes for immediate world revolution and the rapid realization of unalloyed socialist ideals in Russia. This new spirit of 1917 was the inspiration for ten years of futile opposition by left-wing communists. The Program of Revolution The outstanding spokesman of the revolutionary idealism of 1917 was none other than Lenin himself. Spurring the Bolshevik party on toward the seizure of power, Lenin put aside his usual obsession with organizational rigor and conspiratorial discipline, and he penned bold visions of the party's success and the new order which it would bring to Russia and the whole civilized world. His old cautious collaborators from the days of the underground and the emigration were left foundering in leaderless hesitancy, while Lenin himself had taken up with all manner of undisciplined radicals who were ready to share the revolutionary gamble with him. Such were the alignments when, taking refuge in semi-autonomous Finland in the fall of 1917, Lenin composed his chief programmatic work, State and Revolution. The book read like a manifesto of left-wing Bolshevism, indeed, that is its real significance. To consider State and Revolution as the basic statement of Lenin's political philosophy, which non-communists as well as communists usually do, is a serious error. Its arguments for a utopian anarchism never actually become became official policy after the revolution, as the Soviet leadership was always, has always pretended. The Leninism of 1917 was the point of departure for the left opposition, and came to grief in a few short years. It was the revived Leninism of 1902 which prevailed as the basis for the political development of the USSR. The revolutionary utopianism which Lenin expounded in 1917 was inspired by the experience of the Paris Commune of 1871 whose features were exalted in, by Marx in the Civil War in France as the archetype of a proletarian government. Lenin had been guided to this line of thinking shortly before the February Revolution by the left Bolsheviks, especially Bukharin, who in turn were under the influence of left-wing and semi-anarchist thought among the European socialists. In 1917, the quote, communes, state, end quote, was incorporated into the Bolshevik program, quote, a democratic proletarian peasant republic, end quote. The existing state machinery was to be destroyed. Features of the revolutionary government, which Lenin stressed, were replacement of organized military and police forces by the, quote, armed people, end quote, direct popular election of political representatives with full right of recall, and limitation of official salaries to the level of workmen's wages, in sum, every possible extension of direct popular participation in political activities. All of the hierarchic and repressive forms attributed to the, quote, bourgeois, end quote, state were to be eliminated, quote, such a beginning, end quote, Lenin declared, quote, on the basis of large-scale production of itself leads to the gradual, quote, withering away, end quote, of any officialdom, to the gradual creation of a new order in which the more and more simplified functions of supervision and accounting will be performed by everyone in turn, will then become a habit and will finally die out as, as special functions of a special stratum of people, end quote. The institutions through which Lenin envisaged the accomplishment of this transformation, or rather annihilation of the political order in Russia, were the Soviets. After 1905, Lenin had looked to these popular councils of spontaneous origin as the basis for of a revolutionary regime, and he now praised them as, quote, a new, immeasurably higher, incomparably more democratic type of state apparatus, end quote. In April 1917, Lenin asserted, quote, insofar as these Soviets exist, insofar as they constitute authority to the extent of a state, to, the ex to that extent a state of the Paris Commune type exists in Russia, end quote. The basic Bolshevik slogan followed naturally, quote, all power to the Soviets, end quote. 
the function of the party in this early, eagerly anticipated Armageddon was not made entirely explicit. State and Revolution contains only a single reference to the party as an element in the process of revolution. But in various writings earlier in the year, Lenin did map out a role for the party. It should serve as goad and critic of the Menshevik and socialist revolutionary leaders who up to then were steering the revolution. In this way, Lenin suggested in April, quote, it is possible to make the ground so, quote, hot, end quote, under the feet of the petty bourgeoisie that in certain circumstances it will have to seize power, end quote. There was as yet no question of a minority dictatorship. On the contrary, Lenin stressed, quote, to become the power, the class conscious workers must win the majority over to their side. As long as there is no violence against the masses, there is no other road to power. We are not Blancists. We are not supporters of the seizure of power by a minority, end quote. That's fucking hilarious. This was good democratic rhetoric, and at the time, perhaps Lenin could not anticipate how this stricture would be used against him by some of his own followers when he proposed just such a seizure of power. Justification for the Bolshevik drive for power was found more outside Russia than internally. Reasoning from the premises of permanent revolution, the Bolshevik left wing, Lenin now included, envisioned vast but indeterred dependent possibilities of revolution in Europe as well as in Russia. Europe was ripe for revolution, and Russia would take would shake the tree. This was the, a role which the Bol left-wing Bolsheviks regarded as a moral imperative according to a resolution of the Six-Party Congress. Quote, The liquidation of imperialist rules sets before the working class of that country which first realizes the dictatorship of the proletariat and semi- excuse me, the proletarians and semi-proletarians, the task of supporting by any means, even armed force, the struggling proletariat of other countries. In particular, such a task stands before Russia, if, as is pro very probable, the new unavoidable upsurge of the Russian Revolution places the workers and poorest peasants in power before an overturn in the capitalist countries of the West." End quote. For the left wing, international imperialism was the great enemy, and because the provisional government was held to be a representative of imperialism, it made no sense to speak of defending the revolutionary gains which had been made under the aegis of that regime. Thus Trotsky asserted in support of the Bolshevik party even before he joined it, quote, only that party can go in step with the movement of history which builds its program and tactics with consideration of the development of the social revolutionary struggle of the world proletariat and especially that of Europe, end quote. The only significant role for the Russian Revolution from this standpoint was to strike the heaviest possible blow to begin the world revolution to gamble everything on winning the support of the European workers. To Lenin and his supporters, a state of war was a revolutionary asset, impelled by the formula, quote, turn the imperialist war into a civil war, end quote. The proletarians everywhere would simultaneously put an end to the war and carry out the socialist revolution. Should the imperialists stand firm and reject the peace offers of a revolutionary Russian government, Lenin promised, quote, we would ourselves wage a revolutionary war, summoning the workers of all countries to join us, end quote. Bukharin declared to the Six-Party Congress in August 1917, quote, We will wage a holy war in the name of the interests of the, all the proletariat. By such a revolutionary war, we will light the fire of world socialist revolution, end quote. Despite the strength of this internationalist fervor, there were intimations of a contrary attitude which was destined to develop rapidly after the party came to power. Stalin, in his report to the Sixth Congress, analyzed the alternatives of continuing or stopping the war, but entirely neglected the prospect of, quote, revolutionary war, end quote. A resolution on revolutionary war proposed by Bukharin was watered down in committee on the realistic grounds that, quote, we cannot irrevocably assert that we will command the strength to wage a revolutionary war, end quote. The doctrinaire position was exemplified by Evgeny Alexeyevich Priobrzezinski, a re rising theoretician of the left who wanted to restore the original Bukharin resolution. Later on, when Stalin was ready, reading his... Excuse me. The doctrinaire position was exemplified by Evgeny 
Alexeyevich Priobrzezhensky, a rising theoretician of the left who wanted to restore the original Bukharan resolution. Later on, when Stalin was reading his proposed resolution on the prospects of socialist revolution in Russia, Priobrzezhensky interrupted him to suggest adding the words, quote, with the materializing of the proletarian revolution in the West, end quote. Stalin's reply gave a hint of the nationalist doctrine of, quote, socialism in one country, end quote, which he was later to expound, quote, I am against such an ending of the resolution. The possibility is not excluded that Russia itself may be the country which lays down the road to socialism. The base of our revolution is broader than in Western Europe. Here, the poorest strata of the peasantry support the workers. We must reject the worn-out assertion that only Europe can show us the way. There exists both dogmatic Marxism and creative Marxism. I stand on the basis of creative Marxism, end quote. Stalin. Priobrzezhensky's amendment was rejected. Nevertheless, the interdependence of the Russian and international revolutions was axiomatic for almost all Bolsheviks in 1917. There was, to be sure, room for differences. The undercurrent of right-wing opinion persistently discounted the possibility of successful revolution either in Russia or in Europe on the grounds that conditions were not right. But Lenin's leadership, supported by the internationalism of the party's new adherents and old deviators, carried the day for a course of revolutionary boldness. Quote, all the globe, all over the globe, storm signals are flying, end quote, proclaimed the manifesto issued by the Sixth Congress. International revolutionary duty seemed to demand of the Bolsheviks that they strike against the representatives of imperialism in Russia, whatever the odds. On the 8th of October 1917, when he was pressing the party to seize power, Lenin cried, excuse me, Lenin cited reports of mutiny in the German Navy and wrote, quote, we shall be real betrayers of the international if at such a moment, under such favorable conditions, we answer such a call of the German revolutionists merely with resolutions, end quote. The purpose of the October Revolution, in the minds of its most vigorous proponents, was to give the signal for international upheaval by the force of revolutionary example, by appealing for peace, and by standing ready to wage revolutionary war. The Question of Insurrection in the real world, metaphysical webs aside, history is made by people deciding to take action, though whether or not they achieve what they intend is another matter. Such a decision the Bolshevik party had to make in the fall of 1917 to act or not. To translate revolutionary ferment into a coup d'etat or let nature take its course. The decision was made at Lenin's insistent prompting, but like every major step the Bolsheviks took in their early years of power. It was made in an atmosphere of anxious soul-searching and in the face of bitter factional recrimination. The lines of cleavage in the party which Lenin had been trying to weld together opened up again, and the cautious wing of Bolshevism almost fell away irretrievably. The first definite indication that Lenin seriously contemplated a one-party seizure of power and dictatorship by his Bolsheviks came after the July days when the provisional government attempted to outlaw the party after the wave of rioting which it had led. Lenin decided that the slogan, quote, all power to the Soviets, end quote, had outlived its usefulness. He no longer saw the future of the revolution as lying with the Soviets, which the Bolsheviks would prod into action as peaceful collaborators of the other socialist parties. The revolution could progress only through a Bolshevik seizure of power. Quote, the revolutionary proletariat itself must independently take governmental power into its hands. End quote. For the moment, Lenin urged caution and careful preparation. Such restraint met with vigorous objection from the hotheads and M. M. Volodarsky, one of the Mezryansi, who had just joined the Bolsheviks, succeeded in getting the Petrograd city organization to approve a much less patient line. The Six-Party Conference took a determined stand in favor of direct action by the masses. Quote, the task of these revolutionary classes is to exert all their strength to take state power into their hands and to direct it in alliance with the revolutionary proletariat of the advanced countries toward peace and toward socialist the socialist reconstruction of society, end quote. The Bolshevik extremists were happy to break with the Soviets and make a direct appeal to the masses. 
Molotov's march radicalism was vindicated. Quote, power can be acquired only by force, end quote, Molotov declared, with emphasis on, quote, the only way out of the existing situation, the dictatorship of the proletariat and the poorest peasantry, end quote. It was not yet clear what the anticipated progress of the revolution would imply for relations between the Bolsheviks and other socialist parties. Marxists had always assumed that all genuinely proletarian political forces would be united in one party, and this had blocked consideration of the problem of relations between two or more revolutionary parties. In a speech at the 6th Congress of Sokolnikov, exclaimed exclusive revolutionary virtue for the Bolsheviks. Quote, I do not agree with Comrade Stalin as to whether we want to create a united front from the socialist revolutionaries to the Bolsheviks. With the transfer of power into the hands of the Soviets, the power would inevitably go to the Bolsheviks as the revolutionary vanguard and the Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries following the path of compromise with the cadets would be squeezed out of the Soviets because they would have lost all credit in the eyes of the masses, end quote. In the latter part of August, Kerensky's own chief of staff, General L.G. Kornilov, attempted to overthrow the provisional government by a military coup. To meet this threat from the right, the government had to accept whatever support it could muster on the left, and the outlawry of the Bolsheviks ceased to be enforced. On the 4th of September, the Bolshevik leaders, who had been jailed after the July days, including Trotsky and Kamenev, were released. At the same time, popular support for the Bolsheviks and the comparable left-wing tendency among the SRs was snowballing. The simple Bolshevik program of bread, land, and peace was almost irresistible at this hour of crisis and revolutionary emotion. On August 31st, just after Kornilov's movement had collapsed, the practice of unrestricted recall and re-election of deputies to the Soviets produced an ominous indication of the shift of sentiment among the workers and garrison troops in the capital. A Bolshevik resolution for the first time received a majority of votes in the Petrograd Soviet. With this decisive turn in the fortunes of the Bolsheviks, Lenin fleetingly reverted to his earlier expectation of a multi-party revolutionary leadership in the Soviets. Quote, Such a sharp and original turn in the Russian Revolution has now occurred that we as a party can offer a voluntary compromise, our return to the pre-July demands of all power to the Soviets, a government of SRs and Mensheviks responsible to the Soviets. It is overwhelmingly probable that such a government could secure a peaceful forward movement of the whole Russian Revolution. Only in the name of this peaceful development of the revolution, the Bolsheviks would refrain from revolutionary methods of struggle. We have nothing to fear under a real democracy, for life favors us, end quote, Lenin. Nevertheless, Lenin's conciliatory, conciliatory mood was neither consistent nor enduring. Before publishing the article on compromises, Lenin added a postscript declaring the idea to be, quote, obsolete, and he again began to caution the Bolsheviks against illusions of peaceful progress. The vision of cooperation was abandoned by Lenin as suddenly as it occurred to him, though it did leave him espousing once again the slogan, quote, all power to the Soviets, end quote. They were now, or soon to be, Bolshevik Soviets. The Bolsheviks won a victory in the Moscow Soviet on September 5th, and on September 9th, the Petrograd Soviet installed a new presidium with a Bolshevik majority. Responding to this success, Lenin lost no time in making his momentous decision. In two letters to the Bolshevik Central Committee in Petrograd, which he wrote from his Finnish hideout between September 12th and 14th, he announced that the time had come for the Bolsheviks to take the destiny of the revolution in their own hands and prepare for an armed seizure of power. Quote, Having obtained a majority in the Soviets of workers and soldiers deputies of both capitals, the Bolsheviks can and must take governmental power into their own hands. <laughs> or into their hands. History will not forgive us if we do not assume power now. Take power at once in Moscow and Petrograd. We will win absolutely and unquestionably. End quote. Lenin. Lenin's party was far from ready to respond as one man to, call, to his call to arms. At the time, Lenin's appeal for action was received on September 15th. The Bolshevik party was participating 
in the so-called Democratic Conference, a consultative body convoked by the government parties in an effort to rally support before the elections of the Constituent Assembly were held. To the Constituent Assembly were held. The burning issue of the day for the Bolsheviks was posed by a proposition set before the conference by the government that it sanctioned the establishment of a quasi-representative body, the Council of the Republic, which would sit until the constituent assembly could be elected. Should the Bolsheviks continue participation in the representational schemes of the provisional government or boycott them and prepare for revolutionary action in the name of the Soviets? Lenin's proposal for insurrection went beyond what either the cautious or the, old, or the bold factions in the party's central committee were prepared to undertake at the moment. Zinoviev had already written an article published by Stalin on August 30th entitled, quote, What Not to Do, end quote, in which he warned that the fate of the Paris Commune was in store for anyone who attempted to seize power by force. The party, schooled by Marxism to follow the objective groundswells of revolution, had not yet been taught to regard the, quote, art of insurrection, end quote, as the key to political success. Kamenev proposed to the Central Committee that Lenin's call for a deliberate seizure of power by the party be flatly rejected. This open defiance of the leader was rejected by a majority of the committee, but the general reluctance to take the risk of insurrectionary action in view of the Bolsheviks' weakness in the provinces inspired a move to disregard Lenin's proposal altogether and destroy the letters. Someone suggested that this step be modified to keep a copy of Lenin's proposal for the party record. The strength of the right-wing caution in the party was revealed by the split which this innocuous amendment caused in the Central Committee. The vote was only six to four to preserve the text, and six members abstaining. Lenin received no reply at all. Having sidestepped Lenin's effort, first call for an uprising, the Bolshevik leaders in Petrograd returned to the effort to resolve their differences about the Democratic Conference and the Council of the Republic, or pre-Parliament, as it was usually styled, the Democratic Conference, which sat from September 14th to September 22nd, was to pass on the establishment of the pre-Parliament, which actually convened on October 7th. The Bolshevik delegation, or fraction in the Democratic Conference, sought instruction from the Central Committee as to the attitude it should take. Trotsky spoke for a boycott of the pre-parliament. The committee divided nine to eight in favor, but then re referred the question back to the Bolshevik fraction in the Democratic Conference. Trotsky and Stalin, in a rare instance of cooperation, reported to the fraction on behalf of the leftist bloc in the Central Committee, while Rykov and Kamenev spoke of the right in opposition. Excuse me, spoke for the right in opposition to the boycott. The discussion ended with a vote by the fraction. And the delegates defeated the boycott 77 to 50. Trotsky attributed this defeat to the representatives of the provincial Bolsheviks, whose estimate of the revolutionary situation was appreciably more conservative than that prevailing in the capital. Meanwhile, Lenin was urging radical tactics. Quote, we should have boycotted the Democratic Conference. End quote. <laughs> Quote, we must boycott the pre-parliament, end quote. When he learned of the decision to participate in the pre-parliament, Lenin took it as a sign of serious weakness in the party, ignoring all his own precepts of, quote, democratic centralism, end quote, Lenin wrote, quote, we cannot and must not in any case reconcile ourselves to participation. At the, quote, top, end quote, of our party, we note vacillations that may become ruinous, end quote. He singled Trotsky out for praise in defending the revolutionary course. Quote, Trotsky was for the boycott. Bravo, comrade Trotsky. Long live the boycott. End quote. Lenin then began a feverish campaign of correspondence to persuade his colleagues that the seizure of power could and must be accomplished. The poor response to his proddings enraged him. Quote, in our central committee and at the top of our party, there is a tendency of opin or opinion for awaiting the Congress of Soviets against the immediate seizure of power, against an immediate uprising, we must overcome this tendency or opinion. Otherwise, the Bolsheviks would disgrace themselves forever and would come to nothing as a party. For to miss such a moment and to, quote, await, end quote, 
the Congress of Soviets is complete idiocy or complete betrayal, end quote. Here Lenin invoked the international duty of the Russian revolutionaries. Delay meant, quote, a complete betrayal of the German workers indeed, end quote. He declared, quote, we must not wait for the beginning of their revolution, end quote. To this blast, Lenin added a compelling threat. He would resign from the Central Committee and, disregarding his own organizational rules, appeal directly to the party. Quote, seeing that the Central Committee has not even answered my demands, that the central organ, bracket, edited by Stalin, end bracket, is deleting from my articles references to such glaring errors of the Bolsheviks as the shameful decision to participate in the pre-parliament, I am compelled to recognize here a, quote, gentle, end quote, hint that the Central Committee does not even wish to consider this question, a gentle hint of gagging me and of proposing that I retire. I am compelled to tender my resignation from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, leaving myself freedom of propaganda in the lower ranks of the party and at the party congress. For it is my deepest conviction that if we, quote, await, end quote, the Congress of Soviets and let the present moment pass, we will ruin the revolution. End quote, Lenin. Lenin's threat was effective. The bolder group in the Central Committee, simultaneously prodded by Stalin and furnished with his forensic ammunition, won the ascendancy. On October 3rd, the Central Committee heard G.I. Lamov, representing the radicals of the Moscow organization, urge an immediate insurrection. Still unprepared to accede to the advocates of bold action, the committee did resolve to call upon Lenin to come to Petrograd secretly and meet with them to make a final decision on the seizure of power. This step was followed by action on the question of the pre-parliament. Speaking before the Bolshevik delegation, which had assembled for the pre-parliament, Trotsky argued that they stage a walkout on the first day of its proceedings. Kamenev and Ryazanov opposed this and suggested that the Bolshevik fraction await an occasion for reasonable justification before leaving the assembly. The time, this time the vote went to Trotsky. Kamenev vainly protested the walkout decision in a declaration to the Central Committee. He asked to be relieved of all positions wherein he represented the party in public. When the pre-parliament opened on October 7th, the Bolsheviks proceeded with their planned defiance. Trotsky rose to make what was virtually a declaration of war against the government. Quote, with this government of traitors to the people and with this council of counter-revolutionary connivance, we have nothing in common. Withdrawing from this temporary council, we call on the workers, soldiers, and peasants of all of Russia to be brave and vigilant. Petrograd is in danger. The revolution is in danger. The people are in danger. We turn to the people. All power to the Soviets, end quote. Trotsky. The Bolsheviks walked out and turned to the business of insurrection. Events now moved so fast that Lenin failed to keep up with his party. Between October 3rd and 7th, he was still writing, quote, The Bolsheviks have no right to wait for the Congress of Soviets. They must take power immediately. To wait for the Congress of Soviets is a childish play of formality, betrayal of the revolution, end quote. But in the meantime, the Bolsheviks were at work on preparation for the uprising. On October 9th, the Bolshevik-controlled Petrograd Soviet established a military revolutionary committee with Trotsky at its head. Designed initially to wrest military control of the Petrograd garrison from the provisional government, this body became the actual directing staff of the insurrection. Sorry, one second. (laughs) 
On October 10th, the die was cast. Lenin came to Petrograd in disguise to meet face to face with the Central Committee for the first time since the July days. He argued passionately for insurrection and proposed a resolution. Quote, the Central Committee recognized that the international situation of the Russian Revolution, as well as the military situation, and the fact that the proletarian parties have gained a majority in the Soviets, coupled with the peasant uprising and with a shift of the people's confidence toward our party, elections in Moscow, finally, the obvious preparation for a second Kornilov affair places the armed uprising on the order of the day, end quote. The motion carried by a vote of 10 to 2, with Zinoviev and Kamenev standing in opposition. Zinoviev and Kamenev were no more prepared than Lenin had been to bow before what they considered an unwise decision by the majority of the Central Committee. On October 11th, they drew up and dispatched a letter to the major Bolshevik organizations in which they set forth their reasons for opposing the insurrectionary attempt. Quote, We are deeply convinced that to call at present for an armed uprising means to stake on one card not only the fate of our party, but also the fate of the Russian and international revolution. There is no doubt that there are historical situations when an oppressed class must recognize that it is better to go forward to defeat than to give up without a battle. Does the Russian working class find itself at present in such a situation? No. A thousand times no. End quote. Zinoviev and Kamenev. A peaceful policy would capitalize on future mass support. <laughs> and the party should be able to win a commanding position in alliance with the left SRs at the Constituent Assembly. The course of insurrection and revolutionary war only pretended military disaster. Quote, the masses of the soldiers support us not because of the slogan of war, but because of the slogan of peace. If we wage a, war, wage a revolutionary war, the masses of the soldiers will rush away from us. Having taken power... The Workers' Party thereby undoubtedly deals a blow to Wilhelm, but will this blow under present conditions, after bracket, the fall of, end bracket, Riga, etc., be sufficiently powerful to turn away the hand of German imperialism from Russia? End quote. Zinoviev and Kamenev. Zinoviev and Kamenev saw little ground for such a hope. Equally, they discounted the assumption that, quote, the majority of the international proletariat is allegedly is already with us. Unfortunately, this is not so, end quote. On the other hand, they professed not to be afraid to act when the time came. Quote, the development of the revolution in Europe will make it obligatory for us, without any hesitation whatever, immediately to take power into our hand own hands. This is also the only guarantee of the victory of an uprising of the proletariat in Russia. It will come, but it is not here yet, end quote. To put an end to all such lingering doubts and make definite preparations for the uprising, Lenin again came secretly to Petrograd on October 16th to meet with the Central Committee and a selected group of local party leaders. The debate waxed more bitter than ever. Zinoviev and Kamenev pleaded the prudence of waiting for the election of the Constituent Assembly, and Kamenev made a Marxist appeal to the impersonal forces of history. Quote, the question is not now or never. I have more belief in the Russian Revolution. Two tactics are contending here, the tactic of plot and the tactic of belief in the moving forces of the Russian Revolution. End quote. The debate of October 16th in the Central Committee ended with a vote on Lenin's resolution to proceed with the preparation of an uprising. The decision was reached over an opposition no more effective than that of October 10th. The vote was 19 for and 2 against, again Zinoviev and Kamenev, with four abstentions. Some members of the committee, however, while not daring to oppose Lenin, were prepared to vote at the same time in favor of contradictory motions. When Zinoviev introduced a counter-resolution calling for the suspension of insurrectionary preparations until the Congress of Soviets was, already, was ready to meet and its Bolshevik delegation could be consulted, he gathered six votes to 15, with three abstaining. Kamenev, following Lenin's precedent of September 28th, resigned from the Central Committee in protest. It was at this session that the Central Committee created a so-called military center to serve as a liaison group between the Central Committee of the Party and Trotsky's Military Revolutionary Committee of the Petrograd Soviet. Appointed to the new body were Stalin, Zverdlov, 
Bubnov, Uritsky, um, Zerzinski. The center never functioned as a separate group, but the decision establishing it did serve as the textual basis for the legend proclaimed in the official history later on that Stalin was the man in charge of the uprising. See chapter 10. Lenin, returning to his hiding place, penned a lengthy reply to the opposition. Abandoning his own earlier reservations, he swept aside all scruples about majority support for the party by refusing to allow the question even to be raised. Quote, to doubt now that the majority of the people is following and will follow the Bolsheviks means shamefully to vacillate and to practice and in practice to throw overboard all the principles of proletarian revolutionism to renounce Bolshevism completely, end quote. Delay, as Lenin had constantly insisted, was intolerable. Quote, the position of those who, in arguing about the mood of the masses, attribute to the masses their own personal lack of character is hopeless, end quote. Lenin's letter, obviously aimed at Zinoviev and Kamenev, without mentioning their names, was published in the party organ, The Worker's Path, Robachi Put, by installments on, the, on October 19th, 20th, and 21st. The issue for October 20th included a rejoinder by Zinoviev, protesting that his views were by no means as pessimist, pessimistic as those which Lenin had attributed to him. Appended to these statements was a surprisingly conciliatory note by the editor, Stalin, quote, We hope that this the manner excuse me, hope that the matter will be considered as closed with the statement by Comrade Zinoviev. The sharp tone of Comrade Lenin's articles does not alter the fact that we are fundamentally in agreement, end quote. In the meantime, Zinoviev Kamenev the Zinoviev Kamenev statement on October eleventh had leaked out to non-party circles. On October 17th, Gorky's Novaya Zhizn published a report by the Menshevik internationalist, the former right Bolshevik, Bazarov, that, quote, a handwritten leaflet was distributed in the city speaking in the name of two leading Bolsheviks against the move, end quote. Kamenev responded in Zinoviev's name and his own with a note in Novaya Zhizn, or Zhizn, Z-H-I-Z-N, I have no idea how to pronounce that, reiterating their view that an uprising would be a desperate gamble. They denied that the Bolsheviks had set a date for insurrection and tried to disguise the fact that the Central Committee had, over their opposition, actually decided on the uprising. No one, evidently, was deceived or mollified. To Lenin, this published statement by Zinoviev and Kamenev was the most heinous offense they had yet committed. He instantly replied in rage, quote, On the most important question of battle, on the eve of the critical day of October 20th, bracket, the date originally scheduled for the uprising, end bracket, two, quote, leading Bolsheviks, end quote, attack an unpublished decision of the party center in the non-party press. Can one imagine an action more treacherous, more strike-breaking? I will fight with all my power for the expulsion of them both from the party, end quote. The following day, October 19th, he denounced the two oppositionists to the Central Committee and rightly anticipating qualms about expelling them, wrote, quote, The more, out, quote, outstanding, end quote, the strike breakers, the more imperative it is to punish them immediately with expulsion. Only in this way is it possible to make the Workers' Party healthy, to cleanse ourselves of a dozen characterless intellectuals and with solid ranks of revolutionists, to march with the revolutionary workers, end quote. Here was the real Lenin speaking. On October 20th, the available members of the Central Committee assembled, without Lenin or Zinoviev, to deal with the breach of discipline. Zverdlov read Lenin's letters demanding that Kamenev and Zinoviev be disciplined. Trotsky, seconded by his friend Adolf Yoffe, I-O-F-F-E, also a former Mezraya, Mezrayonitz, and now a candidate member of the Central Committee, was most vigorous in pressing the attack. Although he was content to accept Kamenev's resignation from the Central Committee and stop short of endorsing Lenin's demand to expel the culprits from the party. 
Zverdlov and Dzerzhinsky Dzerzhinsky spoke in the same vein. A contrary position was espoused by Stalin, Miliutin, and Uritsky, Uritsky, who attempted to gloss over the issue by proposing to defer it until the full committee could meet. Said Stalin, quote, Expulsion from the party is not a cure, we must preserve unity, end quote. Stalin was to travel a long way from this stand. Trotsky turned his ire upon Stalin, who was vulnerable because of his editorial defense of Kamenev and Zinoviev. Stalin's associate editor on Rabachi Put, Sokolnikov, joined in the criticism of the note defending Zinoviev. Stalin offered to resign from his editorial post, a tactic he was to employ successfully more than once, and received an implicit vote of confidence when the resignation was turned down. The vote to accept Kamenev's resignation again revealed the serious cleavage in the party leadership. It followed precisely the differences expressed in the debate, five in favor, three opposed. The Bolshevik, leader then th the Bolshevik leaders then threw themselves in the effort to seize power. Lenin reiterated his insistence, hardly becoming to a Marxist, that success depended on mastering the art of insurrection. Military action in the last analysis would be decisive. Quote, the success of both the Russian and the world revolutions depended upon two or three days of struggle. End quote. Trotsky and the Military Revolutionary Committee had completed their plans by October 23rd, and on October 24th, the party was ready to move. Kamenev came back shamefacedly to participate in the uprising and to chair the Second Congress of the Soviets. On the following day, the October Revolution was engraved in the annals of history by armed workers and mutinous peasant soldiers, and the Bolsheviks were in power. Their swift triumph proved how unfounded were the Marxian qualms of the Bolshevik right. Coalition or Dictatorship The October Revolution in itself dispelled one of the reasons for the pessimism of the kamenev zinoviev group. The Bolsheviks successfully seized power and organized a new government in the name of the Soviets, headed by Lenin as chairman of the Council of People's Commissars. Most of the British, excuse me, most of the Bolsheviks expected that events abroad would shortly belie the other reason for the rightist pessimism, with the onset of a successful proletarian revolution in the West. In the meantime, the split between the Bolshevik majority and the right wing, temporarily healed during the critical days of the insurrection, was reopened by the question of dealing with the other parties in the Soviets. The left wing of the SRs, alone of all of the non-Bolshevik groups in the Soviets, had given full support to the October Revolution and had contributed to the majority by which the Second Congress of Soviets ratified the Bolshevik coup. Nevertheless, there was much agitation in the Soviets and some of the trade unions and among the right-wing Bolsheviks for the formation of a governing cabinet representing all the socialist parties. Negoci negotiations to this end were carried on between the Bolsheviks and the other parties for several days. The Bolsheviks were not yet committed to a one-party government. Previous objections to the other Soviet parties had been that they were insufficiently energetic in furthering the revolution. Hardly more than a week before the actual uprising, Lenin recalled his idea of a compromise with the Mensheviks and SRs and placed the blame on them for collapse of the plan. When the Second Congress of Soviets ratified the Bolshevik seizure of power on October 25th, it was broadly assumed even among the Bolsheviks that the new government would include representatives of all the Soviet parties. Martov's proposal that the Congress should immediately consider the establishment of such a regime was seconded by Lunacharsky and passed by the delegates unanimously. During the next few days, the most vigorous proponents of a broad coalition government was the National Committee of the Railroad Workers' Union, Vikzhel, from its Russian initials, with which, with its ability to tie up transportation at this critical time, could readily secure a hearing. On October 29th, the Bolshevik Central Committee, in the absence of Lenin, Trotsky, and Stalin, made known its willingness to confer on a coalition as the Vigel desired. 
Kamenev made himself the Bolshevik spokesman and persuaded the Central Executive Committee of the Soviets, two-thirds Bolshevik and the rest largely left SR, to authorize the desired conference. The conference duly met, with a Bolshevik delegation headed by the former Menshevik Ryazanov and including Kamenev as its most prominent member. On October 30th, again without Lenin and Trotsky, Trotsky was in the field to defeat Kerensky's abortive counter-coup, the Bolshevik Central Committee voted unanimously to allow all socialist parties to be represented in the Central Executive Committee, which had become the juridical seat of legislative power in the new regime. The Bolshevik right was again asserting itself. Nevertheless, the success of the coalition idea was rendered extremely problematic by the conditions which the Mensheviks and right SRs insisted on, exclusion of Lenin and Trotsky from the new cabinet, and a virtual repudiation of the insurrection of October 25th. In the meantime, Lenin made the question of participation in the legislative body academic by having the Council of People's Commissars assume the power to rule temporarily by decree. Trotsky, after dispersing Kerensky's forces, hurried to join Lenin in an attack on the coalition idea. This they began at a conference of the Central Committee and representatives of local Bolshevik organizations on November 1st. Kamenev and Ryazanov, reporting on the coalition negotiations, met with a cold reception. Trotsky declared that the insurrection was pointless if the Bolsheviks were not to keep a majority. He and Dzerzhinsky denounced the negotiations for even considering the Menshevik and right SR demand that Lenin and Trotsky be excluded from the government. Lunacharsky defended the negotiations on the grounds that they presumed a Bolshevik majority. Was that they presumed a Bolshevik majority. Lenin saw the negotiations only as a delaying action while the regime consolidated its authority. Rykov replied with surprise that he had been taking them quite seriously. Lenin finally proposed breaking off the negotiations, but was defeated 4-10. to 10. By a vote of 9-4 to 4 with one abstention, the Central Committee adopted the alternative proposed by Trotsky, quote, to permit members of our party to take part today in a last attempt of the left, the quote left, end quote, SRs to create a so-called homogenous power with the aim of once more exposing the bankruptcy of this attempt and finally terminating further negotiations on a coalition government, end quote. Still unsatisfied, Lenin went before a meeting of the Petrograd City Committee of the party where he challenged the Bolshevik right to defy him, quote, as for conciliation, I cannot even speak about that seriously. If you want to go a split, go ahead. If you have a majority, take power in the Central Executive Committee and carry on. But we will go to the sailors, end quote. A naked threat to decide the matter by force. Quote, our present slogan, end quote, Lenin proclaimed, quote, is no compromise, i.e. for a homogenous Bolshevik government, end quote. When Lunacharsky submitted his resignation as Commissar of Education to protest the shelling of the Kremlin during the fighting in Moscow, Lenin demanded unsuccessfully that he be expelled for the, from the party, and he once again accused Kamenev and Zinoviev of treason. Such was Lenin's frame of mind, already set for a decade and a half. Disagreement with his views could only be regarded as betrayal of the revolution. Not many more years were to pass before the frame of mind would be translated into political action. The secondary Bolshevik leadership was strongly in favor of coalition. Lenin was rebuffed in Petrograd, and the Moscow city organization led by Rykov and Nogin openly backed, the Zeno back, excuse me, openly backed Zinoviev and Kamenev. When the Moscow Regional Bureau, distinguished by its left-wing coloration, resolved to accept a coalition if the Bolsheviks had a majority of the cabinet posts. On November 2nd, the coalition issued, issue began to come to a head when a resolution was passed by the Central Executive Committee insisting that Lenin and Trotsky be included in any cabinet and that at least half the portfolios go to the Bolsheviks. In opposition to this minimal condition, the whole Bolshevik right voted against the party. Kamenev, the chairman of the Central Executive Committee, Zinoviev, almost half the Council of People's Commissars, Rykov, Lunacharsky, Nagin, Miliutin, Teodorovich, excuse me, Teodorovich, and others including Lazovsky and the ex-Mensheviks Ryazanov and Uranev. Lenin, in his rage, forced through the Central Committee a resolution damning the opposition as un-Marxist, un-Bolshevik, confusing, vacillating, treacherous, and to top it all, 
undemocratic because they would have the majority give in to the threats of a minority. While he denied that he would not consider a coalition, he appealed to, quote, all skeptics and vacillators, end quote, to give him their unreserved allegiance. Lenin then drew up an ultimatum. The opposition was to observe party discipline and cease criticizing the majority line on coalition or else leave the Bolshevik party and cast in their lot with the Mensheviks and SRs. He sought signatures for his ultimatum among the available Central Committee members and secured nine supporters, Trotsky, Stalin's, Verdlov, Yuritsky, Dzerzhinsky, Yoff, I-O-F-F-E, Bubnov, Sokolnikov, and Muranov. Five refused to sign. Zinoviev, Kamenev, Rykov, Miliutin, and Nagin. The cleavage was identical with the one produced by the issue of insurrection. The opposition disregarded all threats, and on November 4th, the crisis erupted. The Central Executive Committee was discussing the moves made by the government to muzzle the non-socialist press and the representatives of the Bolshevik opposition, apprehensive over the possibility of dictatorial rule, joined in condemning restraints on newspapers which were not actually calling for rebellion. Lauren, a former Menshevik and outstanding exponent of the left-wing program, offered a resolution to this effect. It failed, 22-31, to 31, with a number of abstentions. A Leninist countered with a resolution specifically approving control of the press. This carried by a vote of 34 to 24. Only the Bolsheviks further to the right, Lazovsky and Ryazanov, voted in opposition together with the left SRs. The press issue was the last straw. The Bolshevik oppositionists resigned in mass from their party in government offices to the accompaniment of ringing declarations of principle. All five of Lenin's critics within the Central Committee left. Zinoviev, Kamenev, Rykov, Miliutin, and Nagin. Collectively, they declared, quote, We cannot assume responsibility for this ruinous policy of the Central Committee carried out against the will of a large part of the proletariat and soldiers. We resign, therefore, from the post of members of the Central Committee so that we will have the right to speak our minds openly to the mass of workers and soldiers and to call on them to support our slogan. Long live the government of the Soviet parties, immediate agreement on this coalition, end quote. Three among... These Central Committee members, who were in the Council of People's Commissars, also surrendered their portfolios in protest against a one-party government, Rykov, Interior, Miliutin, Agriculture, and Nagin, Commerce and Industry, as did Teodorovich, Food, and a number of sub-cabinet commissars, including Ryazanov and Lauren. Shlepnikov, the Commissar of Labor, joined this group in a declaration to the Central Executive Committee, quote, we take the stand that it is necessary to form a socialist government of all parties in the Soviet. We assert that other than this, there is only one path, the preservation of a purely Bolshevik government by means of political terror. We cannot and will not accept this. We see that this will lead to the establishment of an irresponsible regime and to the ruin of the revolution and the country. We cannot assume responsibility for this policy, and therefore we renounce before the Central Executive Committee our titles of People's Commissars. End quote. Lazovsky, who had become Secretary of the All Russian Central Council of Trade Unions, issued a separate and even more impassionate statement. Quote, I cannot, in the name of party discipline, remain silent when, in the face of a common, in the face of common sense and the elemental movement of the masses, the Marxists refuse to take into consideration objective conditions which imperiously dictate to us, under the threat of a catastrophe, conciliation with all the socialist parties. End quote. He refused to make Lenin's power a condition. Quote, I cannot in the name of party discipline, submit to the call to personal worship and take po state political conciliation with all socialist parties who agree to our basic demands upon the inclusion of this or that individual in the ministry, end quote. Lenin's invective rose to a new pitch in the reply to the rightists, which he prepared in the name of the Central Committee. Quote, Several members of our party who formerly occupied responsible posts have flinched in the face of the onslaught of the bourgeoisie and fled from our ranks. The bourgeoisie and all its helpers are jubilant over this fact and are maliciously rejoicing. The comrades who have resigned have acted like deserters, end quote. But this defection, Lenin assured the party, would no more deflect it from its source 
excuse me, deflect it from its course, then did the, quote, strike-breaking, end quote, of the two deserters, Zinoviev and Kamenev, before the uprising, quote, there is not a shadow of vacillation among the masses, end quote. Lenin still affirmed his willingness to enter into a coalition where the Soviets and Bolshevik majority were accepted. He actually criticized the left SRs for failing to accept the Bolshevik invitation to join the new government on October 25th. But with no effective leadership or coherent organization, the opposition to one-party rule quickly collapsed. On, on November 7th, the opposition lost one of its principal leaders, Zinoviev, came to realize that history had not taken the turn he expected, and he humbly recanted, quote, under such a state of affairs, we are obliged to reunite with our old comrades in the struggle. This is a difficult time, a time of extreme responsibility. It is our right, our duty, to warn the party from errors. But we remain together with the party. We prefer to make mistakes together with the millions of workers and soldiers and to die together with them rather than go off to the side of this decisive go off to the side at this decisive historical moment. Dissensions may remain with us, but in the given state of affairs, we are obliged to subordinate ourselves to party discipline and to conduct ourselves as did the left Bolsheviks when they were a minority on the question of participating in the pre-parliament and bound themselves on this matter to carry out the policy of the majority, end quote. Quote, there will not, there must not be any split in our party, end quote. I think that was all one quote, but I split it into two because it's like a that last line was separated by a space. Anyway, end quote. And that was Zinoviev. Zinoviev's compunction about a stable and democratic regime had yielded before the fear that he would be excluded from the community of revolutionary faithful. Such an anxiety to use the Marxist simile, quote, runs like a red thread, end quote with curious persistence throughout the history of opposition activity in the Russian Communist Party. Zinoviev was quickly reinstated in the Central Committee. Considerations of principle were stronger among the other opponents of the one-party government, and they maintained their stance of defiance until late in November. In the meantime, time, much of the ground for their protest had disappeared, as agreement between the Bolsheviks and the left SRs on a coalition government was finally worked out. One more crisis was still to be passed before the right opposition of 1917 dissolved. This was the final hurdle on the path to unabashed party dictatorship, the question of the Constituent Assembly. Before taking power, the Bolsheviks had steadfastly endorsed the convocation of the Assembly. Not knowing what else to do, they allowed the elections to proceed as scheduled in November. The results were something of a shock. The Bolsheviks won only about one-fourth of the votes against an overwhelming SR majority. Again, the Bolshevik party was beset by the issue of caution and legal scruple versus bold and forceful action. The Bolshevik right, including Zinoviev, Ryazanov, Lazovsky, who, had jo who were joined by Bukharin on this issue, hoped for some kind of quasi-legal solution. The left-winger Uritsky, who had joined the Bolsheviks with Trotsky, complained, quote, Some comrades are now of the opinion that the Constituent Assembly is the crowning work of the revolution, end quote. While it was becoming increasingly apparent that only a forceful solution of some kind could preserve the Bolshevik government, Bukharin proposed expelling the cadets and having the left wing of the assembly continue to function. The Bolshevik right won control over the party's delegation to the assembly. In the bureau elected by the Bolshevik delegates on December 2nd, the most prominent members were Kamenev, Stalin, Rykov, Nagin, Milyutin, Lauren, and Ryazanov. The Central Committee, with ample justification, declared that the Bureau was dominated by right-wing views, and it finally felt constrained summarily, summarily to dissolve the Bureau. Bukharin and Sokolnikov were appointed to lead the Bolshevik faction, excuse me, fraction, an early instance of a practice destined to assume decisive import. The issue was settled when the fraction endorsed Lenin's theses, making plain his intention to disperse the Constituent Assembly by force. The last echo of the 1917 opposition came from the die-hard right-wingers Lazovsky and Ryazanov. Clinging tenaciously to the principles of democratic legality, they voted no when the constituent, excuse me, when the Central Executive Committee approved the dispersal of the Constituent Assembly. Since both of them were trade union officials, they were 
able to continue their criticism of the government before the first All-Russian Trade Union Congress, which met in January 1918. The issue is trade union independence from the government, a subject which was to generate much friction in subsequent years. On this first test, the opposition to centralization went under, and the Congress resolved, quote, trade unions will become instruments of state authority, end quote. Lazovsky was expelled from the Bolshevik party, and not until the end of 1919 did he return much chastened. His opposition days were over for good, and he survived the purges of the mid-1930s, only to fall victim to Stalin's Jewish purge in 1952. The Bolshevik right opposition of 1917 stemmed from a combination of literal Marxism, political caution, and democratic scruple, qualities which it shared with the Mensheviks. It was a spontaneous rather than an organized affair. In consequence, it was never able to succeed at the moment of crisis, but, on the other hand, defeats could not destroy it. Lenin might overcome the right on a specific issue, but the psychological traits which disposed certain people to favor the right welled up again and again. It is possible to distinguish three contributing groups in the 1917 opposition, apart from the Bolshevik defenses who left the party in April. The main body of the Bolshevik right was the group led by Kamenev and Rykov, and after the middle of the year by Zinoviev as well. Sorry, I'm spacing out. It's possible to distinguish three contributing groups in the 1917 opposition, apart from the Bolshevik defenses who left the party in April. The main body of the Bolshevik right was the group led by Kamenev and Rykov, and after the middle of the year by Zinoviev as well. These people were old Leninists, committed to the hard organizational doctrine, but apparently attracted to it out of a consideration of conservatism and caution. To others, participation in an engine of power was a virtue in itself. And this counts for those Leninists such as Stalin and Zverdlov, who followed the leader steadfastly after his return to Russia. A second group consisted of former Mensheviks who leaned to the right, particularly Lunacharsky, Ryazanov, and Lazovsky. In their reasoning, legal scruples and democratic principles were paramount. They failed, however, to have any influence apart from their isolated individual protests. The last group in, 1917, in the 1917 opposition stood on the left of the party. It was small at the time. Shlyapnikov was its only prominent spokesman, but it was destined to grow into a powerfully disruptive force during the next few years. These were the people who were in deadly earnest about the radical idealism contained in the party's programmatic statements. Revolutionary principle rather than caution prompted them to eschew the expedience of dictatorship. End of chapter 2